everybody. Happy Wednesday. Thank you so much for spending some time with Red Canary today. My name is Susanna and I'll be your moderator. So before we kick things off for a threat detection report webinar, I just want to go over some housekeeping things. The webinar is being recorded, so keep an eye on your email after in about a few hours for the recording. Um, the console you're looking at is 100% customizable. So if you want to adjust the size of the boxes on the screen, that is your prerogative. Um, and we also have that Q&A box. We, we'd love to make this as interactive as possible. So please submit any questions as you think of them. Um, also on your screen is a resources box, which has a copy of today's slides, as well as links to the report, the executive summary, our playlists, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and then if you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please clear your cache and try refreshing the browser. All right. All right, we're going to get started. So as I said, I am Susanna Clark Matt. I'm a staff editor here at Red Canary. Um, and I'm going to introduce my fellow uh, presenters are going to introduce themselves. Hello, <clears throat> I'm Brian Donahue. I'm the principal security specialist at Red Canary. Uh, one of the authors of the threat detection report been working on it. I've worked on all the versions of it. So been working on all six of them. <laughs> Hey, I'm, uh, I'm Justin Schoenfeld. I'm a threat researcher on our threat research team within Red Canary, uh, focusing on cloud and identity. And I'm Katie Nichols. I'm Senior Director of Intelligence Operations. I have the honor of leading the intelligence, threat hunting, and threat research teams. I think this is maybe my fourth threat detection report that I've had the honor to be part of. Great, thanks, Katie. Here's a sneak peek at our agenda for the day. We're gonna go over what this report is um, and then break it down by section. We'll go over our trends, threats, and techniques, and hopefully we'll have time for question at the end, questions at the end. But like I said, go ahead and submit them now because we might be able to fit some in as we go. So what is the threat detection report? Why are we here? The threat detection report is Red Canary's annual in-depth analysis of the trends, threats, and MITRE attack techniques that we've observed over the past year. Um, this is our sixth year doing this report. Every year it gets more technical, more in-depth. This is really in the weeds guidance meant for practitioners. However, we also offer an executive summary that's much shorter than the actual report. Um, and it has key takeaways for security leaders, anyone else who might be short on time. The report does come in two formats. So we have our beautiful PDF, which comes at over 160 pages this year. Um, and we also have an interactive version on the web, which includes even more technical details and information and guidance. That's where you're gonna find your detection opportunities, lists of collection data sources, atomic red team tests, et cetera. So we know that this is annual report season in the InfoSec industry. We are not the only people who do this. Um, but we like to set our report apart from others. How do we do that? Um, for one, we don't expect you all to read all 160 pages of this report over coffee one morning and move on with your day. Uh, the report is highly actionable and is meant to be an evergreen reference that you can refer to throughout the year, well into, Jan into December and November. Um, as you run into the, these behaviors in your environments, as you read about them in headlines, the report is a reference for you through then as well. Um, we also have a custom playlist. Threat Sounds Volume 4 is out. Um, if you explore the web version of the report, you will see that we've embedded a song paired with every single th threat, trend, and technique that we've picked. So you can listen to those songs as you read and as you learn. All right, I'm going to pass it over to Brian Donahue, who's going to talk a little bit about the data in the report. Yeah, so Susanna just talked about basically what is the report from a fairly high level. And I'm gonna tell you about what the report is based on, right? So uh, I'll try to keep this not too specific. You can look at the specific numbers here, but basically we ingest a ton of security telemetry, 216 petabytes of it uh, in 2023 from our customers, 22.5 million plus endpoints, identities, cloud resources, SaaS applications, other IT things. We bring that all into our engine, right? And we've got this library of custom detection analytics that's designed to find potentially interesting events, right? And it finds a lot of them. It found 37 million, far too many for any normal human to go uh, and look at individually on their own. So we've got a suppression engine that cuts that number down a lot. And basically all that does is it says, hey, we have seen this detector 
create this event before and we know it's benign so we can automatically suppress it. From there, we've got a bunch of automation that investigates a lot, of, a lot more of these events. Um, and then at the end of the day, there's about 500,000 or so events that land in our detection engineers analysis queue where humans are investigating these things. Um, between those, of those 10 million events that are left over, uh, we end up with 58,000 real confirmed actual threats. Uh, they may be drafted in part or, or full by automation or by a human, but a human does ultimately end up reviewing all of those, building timelines that include all of the context that a, that a customer would need to respond to those to those threats, um, you know, sort of mitigate them properly. And our threat, our, our report is is really based on like the aggregate of those threats. We kind of try to pull out what is prevalent and what is interesting, and then we write this this really long report about it. All right. So back Thank to you, Susanna. Um, so as you can see, the report is anchored by um, two top 10 lists, which are our threats and technique lists. And that is based on the things that we see every day in our environments at Red Canary. The trends section, however, is an opportunity for us to zoom out from those top 10 lists and really focus on patterns that we see with behavior and also emerging, emerging tradecraft. Um, so this year, we cover quite a few trends, um, including identity, the cloud, initial access, ransomware. We have a new industry section that we'll talk about in a little bit as well. So um, I'm going to pass it over to Justin, um, who's going to talk to us about identities. And I will say that identities kind of weave in and tie in a lot of the other trends together. And Justin will get into why. Cool. Um, so it's really excited for everybody to uh, join us. Hopefully um, everyone is checking out the report already and getting a sneak peek. But just a few highlights that we've uh, com kind of compiled with identities and cloud. So. Um, you know, just to start off, like similar to traditional Active Directory scenarios, right? Like cloud-based identity providers, like your Entre IDs, your Duos, your Octas of the world, are now your central location for securing your identities, as well as even hybrid on-prem to cloud architectures. Um, identity is a sort of like a loaded term, right? Because they could represent a human being, like a, you and me. Could even represent like an actual cloud resource, like an application, a VM, or uh, even like a database. Um, so, like even just to draw a parallel between like an endpoint. Uh, like the world we're accustomed to, right? Like identities are like publicly exposed resources like RDP or SSH servers, right? There's not much stopping an attacker from probing and attempting to gain access to nearly any account with some sort of password-based attack. Well, what does it mean to like really secure an identity? Well, it's a pretty, it's a pretty big question, right? Uh, protecting them usually involves a multifaceted approach uh, to protect against just even the simplest of password attacks, right? Like password compliance, and um, rather like when you're securing your identities, you want to take a multifaceted approach, like doing things like increasing password complexity, right? Uh, routine password rotations. Are you locking out your users um, when there's a multiple password attempts, right? Uh, are you restricting your users to specific network ranges or geolocations where you typically uh, operate your business out of? And are you actually implementing proper uh, MFA? Like one of the highlights of the identity section this year focuses on MFA bypasses that we've seen in multiple public breaches this year and some that we've actually uh, witnessed ourselves with our, own, uh, with our own customers. Cool, so how, how do bad guys compromise identities, right? Initial access can manifest itself in a ton of different ways, especially in the cloud with identity providers and SaaS applications, the sheer size of the attack surface and corresponding like initial access methods is quite literally only you know growing as attackers and Red teamers also adapt their techniques to, to the IT landscape that's quite literally changing every day. Uh, but we're talking simply about like password sprays and credential stuffing or, you know, attackers just straight up purchasing credentials on the black market and reusing them. Um, we've also seen quite literally an uptick in stolen tokens from info stealing malware too, which is which we think is going to be on the rise. Um, and then there's also new ish techniques, right? Like uh, like vishing and cold calling help desk employees to reset uh, a victim's MFA factors, uh, assuming that maybe they have the password or they don't have the password, simply a help desk employee with higher privileges could, um, you know, help the attacker get access to an account just by phishing or socially engineering a help desk employee. So we, I mean, I think everybody's seen that this year with the MGM breach and uh, Scattered Spider constantly causing havoc on uh, quite literally everyone. Um, 
Um, cool. So what are some suspicious logon characteristics, right? Like, well, maybe it's not initial access method directly, obviously. Uh, the result of like many cloud-based attacks will result in some sort of unusual logon behavior, right? We think like investigating a cloud breach uh, or an alert will almost always end up in some investigation into a suspicious logon characteristic, you know, whether that's like a stolen token from a new location or fish credentials being used from an unfamiliar OS or an operating system, right? Like the underlying characteristics of a malicious logon will almost always be some sort of a deviation from, again, like a user identity or a workload identity um, and all those things. So with that being said, having a proper investigative process for investigating these types of alerts uh, or breach scenarios during your IR is the best way to expedite kind of your investigations. Uh, so you're well prepared and can get some good context from uh, for your SOC. Uh, so I think we all know that investigating um, every unusual logon alert can be extremely overwhelming for every security operations center, right? With the proper like tuning of these types of alerts or analytics, uh, these alerts may actually be like really, really good source for identifying signs of compromise, which is things that we've, we, we've seen that in multiple, multiple um, breaches that we've identified on our own. Um, also like IP enrichment, for example, is a really good source uh, of intelligence for tuning and, you know, for your own detection analytics as well. Um, so like, what are some investigative questions a compromised identity um, specifically uh, might do within your environment? So things like, well, well, is the new user agent that we've seen, like, is that from, uh, is that the same as the user's prior behavior or is that like an outdated one, right? Like how often is someone logging in with an outdated browser? Um, meanwhile, we've seen them in the past using a more up-to-date one, right? As your users logging in from a new country, is it a new VPN or proxy? Like all these things uh, are super important to understand and contextualize when you're looking at these types of uh, alerts or events. Um, we do have email inbox rules listed on the slide, but I think we've talked about that pretty heavily in the past. So we shined a light on kind of a new, fairly, fairly newish technique that's not really so often talked about uh, in the public. Um, so instead of creating an inbox rule, we see attackers now modifying what's called the junk mail configuration of a victim account. Uh, so they typically do this during like fund diversion attacks where an attacker may initiate a communication with a payroll employee or like an external vendor. When they modify this junk setting, they're basically marking that co the communication or the email chain as uh, with that employer vendor as junk, sending it directly to the junk mail folder. So typically we've seen that with inbox rules. Um, and so I think everybody's detection on uh, Inbox rules might be a little bit exhausted, so attackers are taking a little bit of a new approach. Um, and so we've we've written about that pretty heavily in the, in this year's report. So hopefully, hopefully you guys can check it out. Uh, so moving on from identity, we're going to kind of mesh that into the cloud. I know identities in the cloud are kind of nicely intertwined, but um, so like like we always say, um, at rather sorry, as the uh, as as big three cloud providers, right? Like as they fight to gain market share in cloud infrastructure as a service, that market is just rapidly expanding. I think everybody's kind of felt that um, on their own. So like we as an industry have 20 plus years, right, of detecting attacks on endpoints and Active Directory environments. Like security teams now are like having to educate themselves on new complex technologies, just like identity providers and the new resources that pop up here and there with their infrastructure as a service platforms, like, you know, your AWSs and your Azures. Um, but the blast radius of compromising an identity could potentially lead to like a much, much faster increased breakout time for attackers as their recon in the cloud often like blend right in with the victim's normal uh, behavior. So that makes it super hard to find attackers enumeration activity, um, which I like to say is like, you know, it's really like finding a needle in a giant haystack of, of, of cloud logs, right? Uh, so talking about um, cloud logs and kind of identifying um, how attackers are abusing the cloud, right? We always like to say internally, like there's no command line in the cloud, which is command line is like a luxury that every defender has, uh, or other every detection engineer or SOC team has. Uh, APIs are the main driving force, allowing adversaries to kind of blend in with with normal resource usage and uh, user behavior. So rather than having hundreds or literally thousands, like we have of signatures kind of based solely on command line, uh, I think defenders need to get really creative with our cloud detections to weed out the good guys and the bad guys using sort of the, the same APIs. 
Um, so in order to do that, you need to have a, a, a really solid understanding of what log data you expect to see, right? Depending on your cloud provider, like the content of these logs may be provided in a single nicely formatted stream, uh, but others may require you to stitch more than one or two logs together and like paint a much, much more of a broader picture of, of behavior during your investigations or even a, a multi-detection like analytic. So what are some of these, some of these logs that we're talking about? Uh, one of the really nicely formatted logs that we've seen is, uh, is CloudTrail. I think everybody's kind of had some experience with it, um, as, long as, as long as you're using AWS, of course. Um, and of course, alongside their, their guard duty alerting um, and then their application performance CloudWatch logs. Like CloudTrail is sort of a luxury, um, or I, I maybe even put them as sort of the gold standard of cloud logging since their logs don't require that, that stitching that we mentioned earlier. Uh, across your multiple log sources, like everything's kind of just in one nice nice spot for you to do your investigation. Uh, Azure, on the other hand, uh, is quite literally like the complete opposite. So some might say like you need a PhD to sort of understand what it takes to understand um, and correlate all of their, their logs together. Uh, this is due to the fact that Azure is an infrastructure as a service platform, like it's also an identity provider with their Azure ID product. Um, which is also used in conjunction with their own SaaS apps, right? Like Microsoft 365 and those, those Outlook teams, SharePoint uh, applications that you're familiar with. Um, your identity provider and SaaS app logs are your unified audit logs, your sign-in logs and your audit logs. And then we're also really excited about the new graph activity logs, which record all of the graph API activities in uh, your environment, uh, which drives all of the SaaS based products and uh, functionality. Uh, in terms of their non-SaaS cloud log, since we're talking about cloud directly, like Azure provides their Azure Activity Log, which records those, uh, you know, those administrative changes like IAM modifications and resource deployments. It's also seen as sort of like the control plane level logs, like like uh, CloudTrail has, um, and they also have an optional diagnostic logging, which are much higher in volume and are seen as like those data plane logs. Um, like those things might include like reading a key vault or accessing storage blobs, which happen millions and millions of times a day. Um, and so GCP is also one of those really nice log sources that provide a lot of, all of the changes to IAM and resources and in a nice single telemetry, telemetry stream like uh, CloudTrail does. Cool, so detecting and mitigating, right? Like, of course this list is just not comprehensive. There's probably tons and tons of more bullet points that we can apply, but one important bullet point we want to highlight here is strictly enforcing MFA, right? As we've reflected on like this past year, we've seen that attackers are constantly bypassing MFA factors after targeting uh, higher privileged users at major organizations, especially in the industries we've seen internally like telecom and hospitality sectors. Um, another important step here is that cloud logging is overwhelming, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, it also requires a lot of investment for your SOC teams to comprehend. Um, again, like there could be a lot of fields that may be difficult to piece other telemetry sources together. Um, not all logs, of course, are built equally. Um, understanding what gets logged is important because not every log source will show you everything that you want to see or everything that a user does, but rather sometimes it might just show you things that the user did in terms of modifications. Um, but like we mentioned before, a lot of the enumeration we see attackers performing may not ever get a logged, right? Like until some some of that modification might occur to a, a resource or a user. Again, um, all those different uh, ephemeral like identity workload um, workload identities, rather. Um, and in terms of storage costs, like this is a good thing because you don't always want to be recording your daily plane logs um, if they're not super useful to you. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Katie, and she'll talk about some some trends. Awesome. Thanks so much, Justin. Just a reminder for folks listening, I see y'all are in the chat, which is awesome. If you do have questions as we are talking, drop those in the Q&A panel. That'll help us stay organized. And we appreciate all of the chat, the kind words about the report. Um, yes, we'll talk about the new logo. You might have noticed we have a new logo. The new canary has a kind eye and is forward facing and is out of the box. So more info. Uh, later on that but let's talk a little bit about how adversaries get into environments and this transitions really well from justin's section because if there's one priority i would say you should focus on for trying to prevent mitigate detect adversaries getting into your environment it's focusing on what justin talked about identities 
right? Adversaries are using valid credentials, valid accounts to get into environments. And as Justin talked about, the thing that's rough about that is arguably it's one of the toughest things to detect. But we saw that throughout the year, right? Valid accounts, that's what adversaries are doing. They get credentials from dark web, scrape from somewhere, and they log in, often without uh, needing to use multi-factor authentication. Another huge trend we've seen, and I've seen a lot of reports across the community noting the same one, um, adversaries are using web delivery, especially search engines, to get into environments. I would actually argue this might be a kind of compliment to defenders. A lot of people have locked down their perimeters, locked down their email ingress routes so well, but one thing that your users will get mad if you blocked are search engines. So we'll have an example of how adversaries are doing this with search engine optimization, SEO poisoning, as well as malvertising, just buying malicious ads, and those are what are served up at the top of your search engine results. Another interesting trend we noted, uh, specific file types used, MSIX file types. This is a specific format used for application package installation. It's a legit format, but in 2023, we saw this was being used increasingly after that search engine optimization delivery vector to install malware. And how prevalent is this? Again, as we're gonna talk about our top 10 threats, malware and groups, search engine optimization and malvertising was a key initial access vector for half of those threats. So this is another one worth paying attention to. Of course, adversaries are still using phishing all of the ishings, vishing, quishing, I don't like saying that word, it's weird, but email phishing, still really prevalent, right? Adversaries using both links and attachments. Um, a couple of file types we saw prevalently this year, zips and rars are still in style, container files, isos and VHDs. Of course, in this webinar, we are just hitting highlights Right, one thing I wanted to note on container files, we have some really tactical specific recommendations. One thing you can do to prevent malware being installed there is prevent auto mounting these container files. Right, if your business doesn't have a legit need for them, just a tactical recommendation. Again, all of this is in our 100 plus page threat detection report. Lastly, we've got to talk about vulnerabilities. I know a lot of people like to panic about zero days and we definitely saw some zero days being exploited. We also saw some older vulnerabilities being exploited. Think 10 year old vulnerabilities, three year old vulnerabilities, especially in perimeter facing devices. Not to pick on anyone in particular, but things we specifically observed, Confluence. Many of you might remember the MoveIt uh, software vulnerability exploitation earlier in the year. So adversaries really like those devices on the perimeter looking for vulnerabilities there. Clicking into that web delivery and search engine optimization example. So this is an example of the delivery we see with a malware family called Gootloader, which was just outside our top 10 threats at number 13. The way this works, you go into whatever search engine, and I will say we've seen this in all search engines. You search for something like simple agreement for future equity, or maybe this time of year if you're in the US, tax agreement, something like that. You get your results back in your search engine and right at the top, you see something titled a ah, simple agreement for future equity. And you're like, sweet, I found exactly what I'm looking for. When you click, your browser downloads a zip file that contains some J script, right? Matches the format shown on the slide. The good news is, right, this is pretty detectable. We often see the word agreement used by Gootloader specifically, right? It's that same zip and J script format. So again, just an example of actionable detection that you can deep dive into. So Gootloader, just one of the many threats using search engine optimization poisoning to get their malware into your environment. What do we do about initial access? Well, what Justin said, um, as I mentioned, Adversaries using valid accounts, right? Really prevalent last year and so far this year, spoiler alert. And so implementing all that guidance, identity access management and all those recommendations, looking at suspicious logins, really helpful for initial access prevention and mitigation as well. On the malvertising side, consider if your enterprise will accept it, 
using ad blocking software. Say overall, it's really tough to prevent users from clicking on those search engine optimized results that have malware, but ad blocking software can help mitigate partially that risk of the malicious advertisements. On SEO poisoning, do some additional user awareness. I will say now, every time I use a search engine, I am paranoid to click on everything because I know how prevalent this is. So bringing in users, helping them understand, again, you're probably not gonna be able to block all search engines, but, right, it's thinking of these, right? Yes, zero days are exploited, but don't neglect older vulnerabilities. You have to prioritize patching, right? What I'd recommend, a couple things, prioritize vulnerabilities in internet-facing software, those edge devices, firewalls, things like Confluence, and a resource that I highly recommend, CISA's Known Exploited Vulnerabilities Catalog, KEV. That gives you a sense of which vulnerabilities your adversary is actually exploiting, a way to prioritize, because we know there are always going to be vulnerabilities in software. That's just how it is. Moving on from initial access as a trend, let's talk a little bit about ransomware. I wish that we could tell you ransomware went away in 2023. It didn't. I think it's gonna be here to stay for a while. The weird thing is though, we know ransomware is still prevalent. It affects a lot of organizations, major healthcare incident in recent weeks, but we as Red Canary actually didn't observe that many ransomware intrusions themselves right, the encryption, the exfiltration last year. What we did observe, though, was what we call ransomware precursors, those things that happen in that chain leading up to exfiltration and encryption. And from our perspective, that's where we would recommend organizations really focus because you can stop the worst things from happening if you stop that intrusion early in that chain. And so since we didn't see a ton of ransomware directly in 2023, like I recommend everyone does, look at multiple sources, right? We look what others in the community are seeing. From the financial perspective, Chainalysis has visibility into a bunch of cryptocurrency. And so this gives us one data point, right? All ransomware data is imperfect, but from their visibility, you can see based on their visibility and analysis, the total value received by ransomware attackers in 2023 compared to 2022 was a lot higher. What this tells us, and again, it's tough to say is ransomware getting better or worse, but I think what I've seen wide agreement on, is so ransomware is still really bad. And even if you might be getting tired of it, oh, this has been an issue for years, unfortunately, it's something you're still gonna have to think about trying to detect and mitigate. So I mentioned we didn't see too many ransomware groups, families themselves, right? But we, what we saw a lot of is what we call these ransomware precursors, tools or threats that are used on the way to that end impact in ransomware, right? These are tools like Impacket, a set of scripts that helps adversaries move laterally and do execution. Things like Mimi Cats, dumping credentials, right? Malware that we know later will often lead to ransomware like Sock Golish or Qbot. We did observe a couple of ransomware groups and right, some of these might be no surprise um, to many of you who track this ecosystem, right? Lockbit really prevalent, Akira. Some of these others you might be like, what year is it? Yeah, we still see WannaCry. Persistence, right? A lot of ransomware intrusions have persistence for years and so we have see persistence from things like WannaCry, Ryuk, other ransomware groups that aren't actually active because these things tend to hang around their environments for a while. So had a great question come in. What would be some pre-activity of ransomware attacks? I'm so glad you asked. Here's a slide summarizing a couple of the key things that we observed in this ransomware intrusion chain. Again, it's important to think of it as a full chain, right? You've probably heard of the Lockheed Martin kill chain or whatever intrusion chain of choice, but it really matters here because what we found time and time again, if you can stop this activity during initial access, lateral movement, reconnaissance, you can often avoid the really bad impactful things, exfiltration and encryption. 
Initial access, we've talked about a lot of these already, valid accounts, vulnerability exploitation, IABs standing for initial access brokers, adversaries delivering things like SOC Golish, and then passing off access to someone else. Another thing we observed in the handful of ransomware intrusions we saw, often ransomware actually came in via third parties. If your network is, is connected to another network and you trust that other network, right? sometimes we see ransomware move laterally from another network. So think carefully about what trusted third party connections do you have? Adversaries get in, then they move laterally. Again, valid accounts. Another one, remote monitoring and management tools, RMM tools. These are tools like Atera, AnyDesk. And what's so tough about these is that often defenders don't know what's allowed or what is just a user trying to install a legitimate tool. Other common, uh, common techniques, right? Built-in protocols, remote desktop protocol, which some people joke stands for ransomware deployment protocol. And yeah, another question came in, does this align to the MITRE ATT&CK framework? Absolutely, all these techniques have um, MITRE ATT&CK techniques assigned to them. Um, deep diving into the report, you will see those technique mappings if MITRE ATT&CK is your jam. Reconnaissance, we see a lot of built-in commands. Another thing that can be tough for detection, deciding if uh, right, an administrator is running who am I, do I really want to detect on that? Maybe not, but we found some of these other reconnaissance techniques and tools like NL test or net scan might be a little more unique. So bottom line, think about ransomware as an intrusion chain. Think about detecting early on. And again, there's so much in the report, tactical ideas for how to detect and mitigate along these phases. A couple high level things we wanna point out, focus on early in the chain you can stop ransomware before it gets to the bad stuff. And a key highlight I'd recommend focusing on, and this is for ransomware intrusions and other types of intrusions as well, remote monitoring and management tools, RMM tools. We have a whole trend section on this. Highly recommend getting a handle on what RMM tools are allowed in your environment. Know your baseline. From there, if you see a new tool installed, investigate it. Go find out. Is this an adversary? Is this an admin or a user? Because sometimes what we've observed in intrusions, that might be one of the few footprints you have on the endpoint to know that something bad is happening. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Brian to talk about industries, a new section for this year. Yeah, I will add one, one thing to what, um, what Katie was just saying. So we have a free tool called Surveyor, um, Google Red Canary Surveyor. It has a definitions file specifically for RMM tools. So if you know what you're allowed to use in your environment, you can run that tool and like find any deviations from it and that'll isolate you know, anything that's not allowed. We also just updated it with a list of a whole bunch of new RMM tools uh, in conjunction with the release of the threat detection report, but I'm here to talk about industries. So. Um, we tried to put industry data in the very first, we didn't try, we did put industry data in the very first per version of the threat detection report. Um, but we kind of like looked at it later and weren't in love with it. And then we spent the next five years trying to figure out a really good way and compelling way to have valid and interesting industry data. And I feel like for the first time, we really figured that out this year. And I think that the core takeaway from the industry section here is that like, it is widely believed throughout the threat intelligence and security industry that different threats affect different industries. And to some extent, there is truth in that, but generally what we found is that an organization's industry is not a key factor in differentiating the threats that they face. So what are key factors? Well, your network configuration, right? Like the way you have your whole network set up, uh, your IT hygiene, which is inclusive of the IT systems you have, the way those systems are configured, whether or not they're patched, whether they're exposed to the internet, also the data that you store within those, um, how you use it, what data you actually have stored. I mean, at the end of the day, most threats that you're gonna face are opportunistic. So they're gonna go after exposed devices. They're gonna go after the data that they find valuable. And for the most part, like doesn't matter what industry you're in. Now, 
certain industries have a certain tendency to use certain technologies over, over other industries, and that might sway the kind of threats you're going to face, but it really has more to do about your, your IT environment than it does uh, your actual industry. So we kind of looked at three, we asked three questions of our industry data. Uh, we'll go through all of them right here. The first was detection volume, right? So what were the differences in detection volume across these different industries? We found that the information and wholesale trade, uh, so the information sector and the wholesale trade sector, they had the highest detection volume. And at face value, you might see that and think, well, maybe those are risky industries to be in. But as we dug into it, we started to believe more that you know, the reason that they probably have higher volumes of detection is because they also have higher volumes of large enterprise customers, at least across our customer base, right? And that's really obvious. If you're bigger, you probably have more detections. However, finance and insurance industry was a, was a an outlier for exactly the opposite reason. Like, just as dense in terms of large enterprise customers, but they were kind of middle of the pack in terms of the number of detections that they saw in 2023. So our hypothesis there was that this is probably a byproduct of them having sort of increased uh, security maturity. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Trust is really important when you're an organization that holds on to someone else's money. Um, I guess that's probably the optimistic reason. The more pessimistic reason may be that they have more stringent regulatory requirements that require them to buy and implement all of these security tools and controls, and they're really good at catching a lot of threats before they kind of break through the outer layer and get to the point where a service like Red Canary is going to be detecting them. So the next thing we looked at were techniques. So someone already asked about MITRE attack techniques. Large part of this report is about MITRE attack techniques, uh, including this analysis we did of industries. And what we found is that there really is very little difference um, in attack technique abuse between different industries. There's basically 10 or 20 techniques and they get abused across all orgs. The order is different. Sometimes something will fall out of the top 10, sometimes something will jump in. But generally that group of techniques is really what we see. Doesn't matter what industry you're in, doesn't matter what year we're looking at. Uh, we could be looking at all of our customers. It really, really doesn't change that much. Um, there were some outliers for that. So finance and insurance, had some kind of, I would say, obscure techniques. Like, I think one of them was like distributed component object model. Um, and our hypothesis there is it really related to what I was just talking about, which is since they've got kind of a wider net of security controls, adversaries have to reach deeper into their bag of tricks and find more evasive, more specialized tradecraft to come over relatively more secure security organizations. Um, Replication through removable media, we noticed that that was affecting manufacturing organizations more. I'm gonna let you guys think about why that may be because I'm gonna answer that question on the next slide. Um, and then last but not least, the information sector, which is kind of a proxy for like, you can think of it as the tech sector. Uh, we saw like a lot of cross-platform scripting threats, right? So we see PowerShell everywhere, but here we were seeing a lot of Unix shell, uh, a lot of Apple script. And our hypothesis here is basically that these are organizations that use a diverse array of technologies. They're using a lot of Linux machines. They're using a lot of cloud systems. They're using a lot of Apple devices. So it kind of makes sense that you would see sort of a broader, uh, more democratic array of, of scripting things being used there. So threat highlights, as promised. So we, we noticed that Gamaru and Raspberry Robin disproportionately affected manufacturers. And these are USB worms. So, right, calling back to that replication through USB media, our hypothesis is that manufacturers may have more permissive USB policies. It may be because they have a lot of legacy systems. It may be because they have air gapped or pseudo air gapped networks. And there's a legitimate business use case for people to need to take a USB memory device and plug it into like a physical computer there. Uh, yellow cockatoo, we saw them being disproportionately affected, or we saw them disproportionately affecting educational services. So Katie kind of explained in detail how Gootloader works a minute ago. Yellow cockatoo has a pretty similar way of uh, initially infecting people. So they use SEO poisoning, people search for things, and then these SEO poison websites, they go to them, they download the payload, uh, and they execute it. And our hypothesis here is that they, they may have like relatively permissive IT environments at schools and colleges so that professors or students are able to do open source research on Google and elsewhere. Uh, one of the most interesting things we found 
is that goot loaders seems to disproportionately affect legal services companies. So places like law firms. And our reasoning here for why we think that happens really relates to what Katie was talking about earlier, right? That agreement thing. A lot of the um, the like lures, I guess you could say, that Google Loader relies on are based in like official legal documentation. So what we think is probably happening here is people are going, there's or people, lawyers and people at law firms are searching for legal documentation. They're finding these SEO poisoned websites and they are downloading these uh, these payloads. So back to Katie. Awesome, thanks, Brian. So that just wrapped up talking about different trends, right? Finishing on industry. Now what I'm gonna dive into are our top threats. So overall orienting you to the report, we just covered trends, then we have threats and then techniques. So how do we define threats? We define threats as any groups, clusters, tools, and malware. And so this is our top 10 based on our visibility over all that data that Brian mentioned earlier. Some of these names probably look pretty familiar to you. Some of them, like maybe our number one charcoal stork, might be a little less familiar. It's a newcomer to our top 10. We'll talk about charcoal stork in a moment, right? And I'll talk about how some of these threats are newer, emerging. A lot of them, though, the interesting thing we found is that they have been in our top 10 threats before. You can see on the far left, right? A number of them, the changed ranking from our 2022 yearly analysis, right? From the previous year. And so what this tells us, again, all visibility is limited, but we can say pretty confidently that these are the threats we've observed affecting a lot of organizations. And so these are good places for you to focus your efforts. And as we mentioned throughout, we have lots of deep dives for each of these pages. We have ideas for taking action, how to detect, how to mitigate all of these threats. So let's dive into our number one threat a little bit. This threat is charcoal stork, and this is an activity cluster named by Red Canary. You know that because our standard is using a color plus a bird name. Um, we should give a shout out to, I think, one of our attendees who was involved in creating this activity cluster it's a very weird one that we've been tracking for well over a year. And like often happens with other analysts, you start to see patterns and you're like, we're seeing this same weird file name. Your file is ready to download. And we hypothesize there's some kind of a cluster there. We started tracking it. And eventually over time, what we observed was that we suspect this cluster is a paper install provider. We don't know all the details of it, which is really weird. Right, We don't know exactly how it works, but we think what happens is basically their customers, someone comes to them and says, hey, I wanna deliver this malware like Chrome Loader or Smashjacker. Can you get it into environments for me? And whoever's behind Charcoal Stork says, yep, we can do that. What's interesting about Charcoal Stork is how prevalent it was. Number one threat in 2023 by far. And its success was due to a trend I talked about earlier search engine engine optimization and malvertising, right? We saw this cluster was really good at that search engine optimization. There was a weekend, I forget in the fall, football weekend, and we saw they use names of NFL teams and, you know, uh, game big games to lure people into downloading this malware. You might not have heard of this cluster because it's a unique thing Red Canary tracks. What we observed, a lot of the community actually just kind of buckets charcoal stork together with the malware it delivers, Chrome Loader. And why we chose to break that out is that what we've observed is the cluster actually delivers different malware, right? Chrome Loader is a browser hijacker. Some people think of it as a nuisance and might not be a big deal, but we and others in the community actually observe different malware coming in through what we suspect is the same paper install provider, right? Smashjacker was another browser hijacker that Charcoal Stork delivered in 2023. And credit to the team at Stairwell, who I believe named this one Vile Rat, a more nefarious malware family that Charcoal Stork also delivered. So this is a concept that we think is important, differentiating the initial access cluster from the malware that it's being delivered, right? And so key takeaway here, Charcoal Stork, really pervasive in environments. You can read a little bit about how you can detect and mitigate it but that's our number one threat for 2023.
Another threat in our top 10 we wanted to highlight, QBot, also known as QuackBot. This shows our relative number of detections for QBot over the year, right? Uh, team Steph and Frank wrote this section. They talked about three acts, right? Early 2023, if you can remember, QBot was everywhere. It's a rough one, right? We saw a lot of it, and it's what we call a ransomware precursor, right? Often leading to ransomware. We saw it kind of go away a little bit in July, which we actually weren't surprised by because they've taken a summer vacation other years. But what we were all a little bit excited to hear about was the disruption, right? Law enforcement action takedowns of QBOT announced in August 2023. Then we observed, again, this concept identifying the initial affiliate versus the malware. The affiliate, one of the affiliates that delivered QBOT, TA577, named by Proofpoint, actually shifted. Following that disruption, right, they shifted to delivering other malware families like Darkgate, PikaBot, Iced ID, right? And in late 2023 and early 2024, we've seen, right, a handful of QBOT infections. Some of those are persistence. But as you can see, it's nowhere near as bad as early 2023, which is kind of the pattern we expect to see when there are disruptions. So QBOT's going to be an interesting one that I'm keeping an eye on in 2024, seeing if it comes back or if those affiliates that were really, really prevalent in delivering it switch to those other malware families. So definitely worth keeping an eye on. One of the things I noted in the top 10 overall, a lot of the top 10 threats actually stayed the same from last year to this year. And what's interesting about this to me is some of these haven't changed a whole lot. Mimi cats. Okay, some new functionality there in packet. But what we see used, same functionality, other malware families like Sock Golish actively developed and changed. But these are some of the threats that we've seen year over year. What that tells me is if you have to prioritize where do you focus, these are really good ones to choose because we've seen them for many years hit a bunch of different organizations. That's the top 10 threat side. I'll pass it back to Brian to talk about techniques. All right. <clears throat> so um, the original threat detection report was built around just a top 10 list of MITRE attack techniques and what you can kind of do, uh, like why adversaries abuse them, and what you can do about it. So we've continued to do that. Uh, and as you can see here, like most of these threats are, are moving up a little, moving down a little, or techniques, I should say, are moving up a little in the list, moving down a little. And then we have the explosion of these two techniques, cloud accounts and email forwarding rules. So let's talk about this a bit. When we're looking at that list year over year from the very first threat detection report, although it's little apples and oranges until now, um, like we mostly see those same top techniques. There's not a lot of drift. Six of the top 10 have been in the top 10 in different places for the last four years. And a seventh one, Windows Management Instrumentation, was in the top 10 for three of those years. So as I was saying earlier, like things will bounce from the teens into the top 10, or they'll bounce from top 10 to the teens, but they don't move around a lot, which is why it's really unusual when we have two extremely emergent techniques in the top 10. So we'll start with cloud accounts. Uh, Justin already talked a bunch about the technical challenges of securing the cloud, so I'm just going to kind of talk about why we're seeing this rise. Uh, so we saw a 16x increase in detection volume. It went from 46th ranked in 2022 to 4th ranked across 2023. Um, I think it affected three times as many customers. So why is this? Well, there's a lot of reasons. One is increased attention from adversaries, but I wouldn't ever want to suggest that that's the only reason. Uh, there are things that they want in the cloud and they got to go to the cloud to get them now. So that makes sense. But there's also increased attention from, from defenders, from people like us, right? So vendors are making more security tools. Uh, your industry or your, um, your cloud service providers are, are creating better log sources. So we're getting better, better visibility and we're getting better security control. So it's just more eyes on the cloud uh, from both directions. And then the other thing is kind of just a nuanced thing with MITRE ATT&CK itself. And this is a really broadly scoped technique. So like, honestly, any time anything's really happening in the cloud, there's probably a legitimate or valid cloud account involved. So when we're talking about, you know, cloud intr intrusions or, or cloud incidents, like you're almost always going to have uh, a valid account there. 
So the other really, really emergent technique here was email forwarding rules. Justin already touched on it a lot. Uh, I think we saw like a 600% increase there, went from like 38th or something to, to sixth. And um, like, it's very closely bound to the identity, the identity stuff that Justin was talking about earlier. Also the cloud accounts technique that I was just talking about, right? So very frequently when a cloud account or an identity gets compromised, we see really rapidly, um, particularly like in like Azure, we see really rapid movement from there into a SaaS application, like your email application where adversaries are, are doing reconnaissance, um, they're setting up email forwarding rules. They're trying to skim payment from either from vendors who are going to pay your company or from employees who are going to get paid by the company. Um, and they're forwarding those emails into weird places that you're never going to look. And they're taking the money and they're running away. So beyond like things that are you know always prevalent and things that sort of became prevalent for the first time in our data set at least this year, we also have like we've given ourselves some wiggle room to have featured techniques, right? Because if we just went by prevalence, like it's just the way it is in the enterprise world, nothing on macOS would ever be prevalent because so many more organizations use Windows machines. So um, some of our featured techniques this year, which you should definitely check out if you're in a Mac shop, are Apple Script and reflect, reflective code loading. Uh, reflective code loading is bigger than just Mac OS, but for the purposes of this report, we scoped it only to Mac OS. We've also been noticing this new installer packaging format from Windows called MSIX. Um, it, you'll notice it like across various threats that are in the threat section of the report, but it's emerging very quickly uh, as a mechanism for adversaries to deliver payloads to their victims. Um, and then beyond that, like across the entire report, we have extensive guidance on how you can use Atomic Red Team to validate your detective controls against the trends, threats, and techniques in this report. I already mentioned Surveyor. Um, we've got some new tools in here that include a new Atomic Test Harness uh, that's mapped for that reflective code loading. And then also, a PowerShell triage script for taking these MSIX packages and sort of picking them apart and seeing the component parts of them. So back to Susanna, I believe. Yep. All right. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, we have a minute or so for questions if anyone wants to sneak some in. Um, but for now, we just really appreciate you all spending time with us today. Um, the most important thing for you to do now is to go read the report. Um, there's also the executive summary that you can digest a little more quickly. Um, and that threat sounds playlist as well. So all those resources are linked in the resources box and um, you'll be getting a recording of this webinar as well as the report in your inbox as well. Um, and Susanna, we had a question come in um, from Steven. Um, I mentioned ransomware moving laterally from trusted third parties, asking for some detection mitigation advice. Um, so like any good boss, I asked the rest of the team. Um, so here's a couple things from our threat hunters, detection engineers, Intel folks who see this all the time. Um, network segmentation, right? This was a huge issue we saw in one ransomware incident in particular. Um, adversaries moving laterally via RPC and SMB. Um, and so having an understanding of what normal movement from that third party should look like. Um, so segmentation, uh, the less exciting answer of basic IT hygiene updating, uh, always a good one. Application control is one, um, you know, something that Justin talked about earlier, limiting account access, right? Least privilege, zero trust, whatever you want to call it, but making sure that those third party accounts from that third party only have the permissions they need is another one. Um, so I think those were some of the key takeaways uh, from the team. And again, a lot of those are sprinkled through the report, but hopefully that helps a little. Great, thank you so much, Katie. A great answer to a good question. Um, all right, um, as we X out of this webinar, we would love if you took a minute to um, fill out our short survey. We appreciate any feedback on how we can improve our webinar. Um, and again, we thank you so much for your time. Read the report, talk to your team about us, and let us know what you think. Thanks, everybody. Oh,